Good evening. Hope we're all having a better evening than Clark so far. <laughs> all right, tonight uh, we begin a new teaching series, the book of 1 John. Um, the goal is to cover this short epistle over the next 12 or 13 weeks. And so that's going to lend us to a, a few longer texts, but I think uh, it is manageable for us. Um, and as we read this epistle, obviously we're reading God's Word, right? So it's profitable for us uh, to teach us and train us. But we're also reading uh, the words of one of the most influential uh, persons in the beginning of the New Testament church. And Paul even refers to John as one of the three pillars um, of the New Testament church in Galatians 2 9. So we're reading somebody who spent significant amounts of time uh, with the Lord Jesus in the flesh. And so we're reading someone with great wisdom. Um, many of the commentators I've reviewed have said that he was often referred to as the elder. Um, he was believed to be the oldest and last living apostle. Um, likely at the time he wrote this epistle. Um, and so, in all the experience, uh, all the wisdom, all the understanding uh, that the apostle has, he combats false teaching, uh, not with eloquence and uh, detailed speech, but with the plain truths of the gospel. And so that is convicting and challenging to me, uh, full disclosure. Uh, there may not have been a time in my life where I've had more of a desire, sinful desire, to please people uh, listening to me, right? And to be liked and to feel like the message is clear uh, and useful. But with all of his authority that John had, he would say to simply, tell the gospel, tell the truth. And so that's our calling um, in simplicity. Uh, legend says that John, some of his teaching was simple, that uh, in his feeble age, at the end of his life, he would often be carried in uh, to the assembly on the Lord's Day um, on a pallet. And he would just simply so that he could tell the, the body of believers there to love one another. Um, so even in all of his time, he gave a simple message of love. Well, uh, this evening we're going to be looking at the prologue of John or 1 John, which is the first four verses. So if you have your Bible, turn there and we'll read that together. First John 1, 1, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and have touched with our hands, Concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things to you so that our joy may be complete. Let's pray together. God, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the, the supernatural provision and protection that you've placed over it, that you've preserved it for us, that all of these years later we have your full and complete word. God, I pray tonight that as we look at the text, we would be challenged. Um, we would see you. We would see the Lord in the words. And it would be the word, the word that gives us the authority. And not anything eloquent, not anything uh, man-made that comes from it. Most of all, we ask that your name would receive all the glory uh, for our time this evening. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so um, we're going to give a short introduction, talk about some things we may not talk about each week in here, but first of all, we'll talk about authorship. I've already assumed 
and I think we would all assume, and I think it's true, um, that it is the Apostle John um, who we credit with writing this. Um, although uh, the epistle to Hebrews and this epistle are the only two epistles in the New Testament that the author is not named. So, obviously, there's no question then that there's been debate uh, throughout the years regarding authorship of those two. Now, Hebrews much more so. Um, really, most of the debate about who wrote this epistle is really in the last few centuries. Um, for the vast majority uh, of the centuries since it was written, at least 18 or 19 of those, there was pretty much uniform consensus that it was the Apostle John, now the same author of the Gospel, the same author of the book of Revelation. And even uh, what I have seen, which I obviously could be wrong, I'm no scholar, but what I have seen, it looks like um, even the common arguments are just that it was somebody else named John, and, and really they're not uh, substantiated uh, in any way. The, the evidence seems kind of minimal and circumstantial. So <clears throat> just a couple of simple evidences for this uh, authorship of the Apostle. Um, like I said, nearly unanimous agreement uh, throughout church history. If we go back to the earliest writings, the earliest testimonies, of these texts, the uh, second century and third century um, church fathers all ascribed authority to the Apostle John. Um, and there was much more, several names here uh, Irenaeus, Origen, Cyprian, Dionysus, all these second century and earlier. Um, and then the church historian Eusebius also said that. And these are explicit namings. There's also tons of other people uh, later who said something similar, just not as explicit as them. So, nearly unanimous agreement in the church. And then also, uh, just in some simple ways, there's a lot of unity in the message. Uh, there's stark differences, light and dark, um, love, son of the father, son of the devil, things like this that are uh, consistent across the two works, meaning the gospel of John and the epistle of First John. So they have a lot of writing style, uh, similar phrases, Together, um, there are many, many phrases that are in the epistle of 1 John that don't occur in any other place except for John's gospel. So there's lots of similarity in grammar. And, you know, they're more alike than even like Luke and Acts. You know, there, there's not much debate on that, that uh, Luke wrote both of those and the epistles of um, Ephesians and Colossians. We, we all ascribe those to Paul, but these two are actually closer uh, in grammar style than those two. So those are a couple of simple uh, things to not get too deep in it. Um, as far as the context of this epistle, now I want to say a, a couple of words, because obviously um, this letter was written uh, to Christians that didn't live in a vacuum, right? Um, the, the early church, the New Testament uh, time we're looking at, they didn't exist in an empty culture, right? They went out into something. And so what was the culture like? And that, that's obviously, uh, we have to admit, one of the great challenges when we try to apply the Scriptures is because without the context and understanding, we sometimes fail in our application. Uh, but one of the uh, big influences is obviously just the Greek culture. Um, Alexander the Great had conquered most of these lands before this. Most everybody outside of Jerusalem were significantly impacted by Greek culture. And so that's uh, the context we go into. And really, I, I'm not an expert on that. I don't have time to parse out all the little things that that can mean. But I think that we will see um, over the next several weeks that John is battling some worldviews, um, and he's trying to encourage his recipients to be able to battle these worldviews that are impacted by this Greek culture. Um, one of the customary understandings uh, that we see reading commentaries, if you have a study Bible, they'll probably mention it, is that John was writing um, to defend against a kind of early stages of something called Gnosticism. Um, and so there's a, a thousand descriptions people can give of Gnosticism. And so if you're not familiar with Gnosticism, uh, the truth is you're in good company because really no one is. Uh, there's no one uh, Gnostic ideology. Um, it was kind of like Plato. Um, it would just 
Uh, one of my favorite you know, historians, James White, I'll probably mention him a bunch in the next several sermons, but he, he describes it like Plato, meaning that what happens when you drop Plato? You know, you've got brand new Plato. Yeah, I have a little kid, so I'm looking at Plato all the time, and it's off. Uh, let's just be honest about that. Worst toy. But you drop clean Plato, and it picks everything up that it touches, right? And, and Gnosticism is kind of like that. Uh, so it, it's really birthed out of Greek mythology and, and a lot of issues in Greek mythology. But as it goes through time and movements and centuries, it just gathers up pieces of whatever else things there are that people believe in. Uh, one of those being Christianity, right? So uh, some historians have said that some 2nd century and 3rd century Gnostic movements were some of the most dangerous false teachings that have ever been uh, in, in the life of the New Covenant thus far. And so, because basically what they would do is they would, like I mentioned earlier, they would pick up, add little things that are deceptive, and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference in some places of what you're actually looking at. And so, really, um, a lot of what, we, what you will read about Gnosticism was really kind of confirmed uh, in the last century. And so, all the things we had about Gnosticism was from early church fathers before 1940s and 50s. Uh, the Nag Hammadi Library, I think that's how you pronounce that, uh, we uncovered some actual manuscripts of some of the Gnostic writings, and it turns out that the church fathers were accurate in how they described it. Um, but you know how that goes. Uh, when, you, when you disagree with someone, you don't usually give them a fair shake, right? And so we, we couldn't always assume that what some of the early church fathers said uh, about the Gnostics was 100% accurate because we couldn't hear them for ourselves. But, but even God has blessed us in preserving even wrong writing so that we can see uh, what the opponents of the Christian faith believe. But ultimately, e even if you read it in a commentary or a study Bible, we can't know for sure uh, that he was addressing Gnosticism because it didn't get super popular until it, about 100 years later. Uh, but it's likely that he was. And so, some of the main aspects of Gnosticism um, was this. Uh, number one, um, it comes from the Greek word knowledge, gnosis. And, and the belief was that salvation and enlightenment came from this greater knowledge, this, this secret cryptic knowledge uh, that as you gained in spirituality, you would know. And, and if you didn't have the secret knowledge, you didn't have the truth. And so the Gnostics would say that they had knowledge from God, from the divine light, greater than the apostles. So it's easy then that they would gather teacher or gather followers from this uh, mystic and cryptic knowledge and secrets and things that they did. And some other Gnostic teaching is because it was based in Greek mythology, is very dualistic. And this idea that everything flesh and everything material is evil, uh, and then the spiritual is good. And so there was all sorts of strands of that, but a lot of times what you would have is a total destruction of the body or just total wicked uh, sensuality being totally fine because, after all, um, what, who cares about the physical body? It's, it's just a prison uh, for my spirit that is good inside, and I have to unleash that spirit to be enlightened. Which obviously... Well, not obviously. Commentators would agree that comes pretty deeply from a mythological, Greek cultural ideas in those types of religions. And so, obviously, when, when we think about Christianity, and we think about a uh, primary tenet of Christianity, one of them being the literal incarnation of Jesus, right? That God becomes a man and puts on flesh and is here physically, that causes problems when it comes to this Gnostic idea. And we'll see a little bit of that in our text this evening as John does address some of those things specifically. Well, with all that being said, um, I do think it's important to, to make a note that John's focus in his epistles 
isn't like a reactionary, defensive kind of posture. Uh, John writes as someone with authority, and, and he doesn't try to be anti-Gnostic. Uh, he's, not, he's not trying to be in defense. He's on offense. He, he teaches the truth of the gospel, the clear, unadulterated, foundational things of Christ, uh, who Christ was and what he did, and that's how he combats uh, the false teachings. And so that, that should be a lesson to us before we begin as we look at this book is that it's not going to be anybody's depth of understanding or intellect or I love fun facts. I can learn all the fun facts about every type of weird thing that exists, but none of that is ultimately going to help me uh, grow in the knowledge of the truth and defend false teaching. It's the truth of the gospel alone that does that. And so that's a lesson to us. 1 John 5, 13, John kind of gives a purpose statement. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So if, if you remember from the Gospel of John, he talks about it, write these things so that you may know and believe. Uh, his first epistle is that you may have assurance. Um, so that, that's his purpose in an age of skepticism um, where truth is rejected by most people. Absolute truth is mocked and foolish. Um, there's new spiritual experiences and experts of spirituality all around. John writes, as a pastor, comforting us with the truth of the gospel that will give us assurance and flow into a faithful living now. And that was then. Uh, it's super applicable today. Because you can make that same description. Uh, Gnosticism isn't dead. Uh, it just wears different clothes, right? And, and walks here. And so there's all sorts of false teachings and all sorts of super spiritual thoughts um, that we can apply these principles to now. Well, if you look at verse 1, oh, we'll start from there. There's a, a brief introduction uh, to get us at least thinking about the context here. So, 1 John 1, starting in verse 1. This is going to be fun. i got a fly that keeps landing on my Bible up here. So if you see me fighting, I'm not crazy. Well, I am, but that's why. So, 1 John 1 says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. So, first point I'd like to make as John is giving this picture uh, in the epistle of who the true Christ is, uh, he begins by affirming uh, the eternal nature of Christ. Right? He, he begins by affirming the eternality of Christ and uh, the message of Christ. But first, the eternality of Christ right there in verse 1. That which was from the beginning. So John uses this phrase here in the Greek, uh, from the beginning. Apo arche, it's my best attempt uh, at that. But arche, you know, you can hear it, you think of the term archaic, you know, something old, ancient. Um, this phrase is used throughout the New Testament to mean beginning, origin, the first place. Now, now some people have said that this, the beginning here, is actually just referring to the beginning of Christ's ministry. Um, that could be true. Um, after all, Mark 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning of the gospel of Mark, of Jesus Christ, it's the same word, and he's clearly talking about that. But I think in light of John uh, as the author, and, and that he uses the same phrase in John 1.1 1, 1, when he's talking about the eternal, eternality of the Word, that he's probably referring to that. But both, both are true, I assume. And so he is testifying, in my view, uh, to the eternal nature of the Word of life. And so the eternal nature of God is obviously something that should always draw us to worship. Um, it's, as you sit and ponder, eternal things, 
Um, I think at some times, you know, Scripture says eternity is written in our hearts, and so at some times we can grasp one aspect of eternity in the future, right? You know, it's easy for us to think about that. You know, it, even in our foolishness, sometimes we think that we'll never die and that we'll just live forever and ever, and we, and we will in the gospel, but the point I'm making is we, we view eternity that way. But what about the other way? Right? Christ had no beginning, right? There is no start uh, with Him. And so there's this giant chasm, I guess you could say, between what's created and what's the Creator, right? On one side of the chasm is eternal nature. Everything else is on the other side, right? So the Godhead alone exists on this eternal side. Um, and obviously that makes our minds spin, but... After all, we are simply created. Right? We can't expect to understand the fullness of God's mind, but he's speaking here of the eternal nature of the word of life. Uh, you notice there in verse 1, um, at the end of verse 1, he's referring to the word of life. All this is concerning the word of life. And so John will not name Jesus until verse 3. Um, but he's in, referring to him. In verse 2, he will call him the life. And so we know from John's gospel that he liked to use the term the Word uh, to refer to the Christ. You think of John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, this word here is the word logos. And so it, it can mean a lot of things. Uh, it, it can mean just a word. It can mean a decree. Uh, it can mean a saying, a speech, a a teaching, a rationale, and reason. Now, e even uh, early century Greek philosophers would refer to this logos in, in their own mind that was the divine reason uh, that was at the top of all things, this divine reasoning that coordinated the universe, uh, which we wouldn't simply call it a divine reason. We would call it the Lord, right? God is orchestrating all of that. But he refers to Jesus as the logos uh, this is an unknown commentator. I, I don't know if much of you use a blue letter Bible, but this was referenced uh, there, and I couldn't find a source, but I thought it was appropriate. It says, In John, the Logos denotes the essential Word of God, Jesus Christ, the personal wisdom and power in union with God, His minister in creation and government of the universe, the cause of all the world's life, both physical and ethical, which for the procurement of man's salvation put on human nature in the person of Jesus the Messiah, the second person in the Godhead, and he shone forth conspicuously from his words and deeds. And so he was clearly seen in, in all of his actions to be proven to be what he said he was, which was God the Logos, the full revelation of God. And so the word of life is the demonstration of God's plan that we see most clearly in Christ. Right? And so when he uses uh, this phrase in the beginning here in verse 1, I think in light of his use of the Logos and what we will read later, I think that he's not only referring to Christ, although he, he is that, I think he's also referring to the message of Christ, uh, the truth of Christ, the plan of Christ, the plan of the gospel, the plan of redemption. I, I believe that John is referring to the eternal nature of that as well. Uh, Ligon Duncan said it this way. He said, The gospel message is eternal in origin, because it is rooted in the Eternal One. Thus it is fixed and unchanging, and therefore it is not novel at all. And although not novel, it is everlastingly fresh. And I think that's, I think that's a helpful description of the message of the Gospel. It's fixed and unalterable, right? From the very beginning, the first messengers of the gospel preached the same gospel that we preach now. Right? It's an unchanging message. Faith and repentance in the Lord Jesus Christ 
for salvation. And I think, I think John is pointing to that here in the introduction of this epistle. Uh, he's pointing to that. And we'll see later we have fellowship in that. But I believe that the eternal nature of the message is true also. So if the unchanging message is rooted in the unchanging Savior, um, how are we to think of this? So when we try to apply this and we think about eternality, we think about the unchangeableness of the gospel, I'll ask you, uh, do, do you see yourself as being in danger of changing the message of the gospel? Do you see yourself as being in danger of that? I think John uh, knew that there was lots of danger around that was posing that. Now, I don't think that we're necessarily in danger of this big, obvious falsehood right now. Right? I think we would be able to spot a false teacher if they come among us, right? Um, if I start just continuously saying over the next several Wednesday nights all sorts of lies and false teaching, I think y'all will know that, right? But that's not really the danger for us, right? The danger for us is in the obscure. The danger for us is not in the obvious falsehoods. It's the blind spots. We all have them. You know you, we know you, the idea, you're driving in a car, you... Well, now, y'all rich folks have the sensors that tell you that when you, somebody's in your blind spot, right? It's the Spirit. There's an illustration there. The Spirit convicts us, right? But seriously, though, um, we used to not have that, right? None of, my, none of my vehicles have that, and that's hard to see. And, and so for the Christians, it's the same for us. We, we all have blind spots. And, and I think that one of those that's in danger for us is when we can easily give attention to secondary issues and prioritize those to first level, right? Um, we're, we're obviously in danger of doing that. We've got the gospel right. Everybody else doesn't. You know, things like that that we'll think, and before long we've easily been hypocrite in a moment. And so I think that Whenever the gospel is no longer the primary reason for what we do, we've altered. Uh, uh, we're, we're living a lie, preaching a falsehood. So, John first, he affirms the eternal nature of the Christ and His message. Second thing, look, look here at verse 1 again. starting in kind of verse 1b, says, which we have heard, uh, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. So John already, he's talked about the eternal nature of Christ. The second thing he points out is the historical, physical reality of Christ, right? The, the physical, historical Christ. Um, and I think, you know, in light of what we mentioned, the dualism that was probably prominent, it's possible that he's making a direct stab at that. Um, he, he over and over and over and over and over again things that describes physical things. You know, we touched him, we heard him, we saw him, we looked on him. Um, we felt him with our hands, and he says there in verse 2, twice he says that he was manifested to us. He, he was made physical. He was made to appear um, to us. Uh, when, when manifest, this term here in the Greek is used of a person, it's they're exposed to view. They're made to where everybody can see them. It, it's manifested. And so I think John is, is hammering this in. After all, this is foundational Christianity, right? Um, we believe in uh, that Christ was eternally with the Father. Uh, he was born literally of a virgin in Bethlehem. He lived a physical life. He died a physical death on the cross. And he had a physical resurrection. Right? His, his body raised physically. Two natures. Um, one 
person. And so he was a physical presence with them. He came physically. He was not a mystical reality or anything like that. John is hammering this home. Um, in Second John, uh, he brings it up again. Uh, in the next epistle, he says in verse 7 of Second John, Many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such a one is a deceiver and the Antichrist. So, so John is obviously making a response there to this teaching. But he's pointing us to the incarnation. Um, Christ is the God-man, truly God, truly man. This is a central teaching of our faith, non-negotiable. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, Romans 1.3, uh, Paul writes that He was descended from David according to the flesh. This emphasis on the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16, He was manifested in the flesh. Uh, 1 John chapter 4 will be there in several weeks. He says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess this is not from God. So, he affirms this exclamation point, the incarnation. And so, and so why, why does the incarnation matter? Obviously, it's the truth. It's true. Um, so it has doctrinal implications uh, to our faith. It's foundational. Um, Jesus was, was and is a real historical person, a figure. He walked physically on this earth, died a physical death, physical body, physical resurrection. Um, so that's important because we like, likewise, our, our hope is not a mystical resurrection, right? Uh, our hope is not a... Uh, super spiritual resurrection. Yes, our, our, our spirits before the end will, will raise, but ultimately, there's going to be a physical resurrection, right? The, the kingdom of God is a real king. It's not a fake kingdom, right? It, it's not a pretend kingdom. We're, we're not waiting for a pretend kingdom or a pretend savior. This is real, manifested, physical. So it matters. Uh, Jesus' body is not in the grave, right? If, if Gnosticism was true, if, if the super skepticism, mysticism was true, we'd have found it by now. But it ain't there, right? Because He's raised physically. And if He didn't, we would not. Our, our hope would be gone. He's the forerunner in our resurrection. We will have a physical resurrection. Um. It wasn't a ghost or a phantom that appeared to 500 people, right? It was the risen Christ in a glorified physical body. So there's the doctrinal implication. Secondly, there's practical implication. Um, contrary to what a lot of these false teachers said, and even today, um, experiencing Christ in the gospel is, is not a mystical, spiritually transcendent, only intellectual enlightenment, right? Everybody can tell you all those things, but it's not that. Uh, I believe that the effects of us experiencing Christ will be seen literally in the material world, right? Now, I'm not saying that we're hoping in material things. That's not what our hope is. But this is a real gospel, right? This is a real truth. The, the gospel actually changes things here, now. It actually does that. And so, the kingdom of God's a real kingdom. It's not a theoretical kingdom, right? The New Testament church is a visible reality. It's not a metaphysical thing. Uh, repentance and faith are visible realities. And if they're not you should be concerned for yourself, right? But you're going to see it. There's going to be physical manifestation of that. 
And so we, we should live with an appropriate expectation of that, right? Uh, that, that's one problem, I think, is we have, we have such a dead hope sometimes, uh, and much of our culture doesn't see that Christ can accomplish anything, really. One day, that's not, that's not the hope the apostles had. That's not the hope our church should have. The gospel makes a real impact now. Christ is king and has an everlasting kingdom and an everlasting dominion, right? So he should make an impact now. All right. Look at verse 2. Again, he says, We have seen it and we testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. So we, we proclaim also to you. So the third point I'd make is that John is clearly telling us that this word of life is proclaimed. That there's proclamation, right? There, there's gospel telling that happens. So according to John, that what was manifested to him, the word of life, becomes the basis that he tells people the truth from. It's the basis of his proclamation. It's this. And so, the, you think of it this way. The time in the life of the apostles that they spent with the Lord Jesus was not for the purpose of just uplifting the apostles to some elite group, right? Uh, it was not meant to be an uh, individualized experience that they kept to themselves and that didn't have any impact. No. Right? They turned the world upside down. We read in Acts, right? The, the experience they had with Christ wasn't this private experience. Um, God gave them that, and those experiences then gave them a responsibility and, and really a mandate that they must proclaim, right? I tell you, it's true for us. It, if we've experienced the gospel, we must. We must. They say, we have seen, uh, we have heard, we proclaim. So, so the we here, they did not hoard the message. They didn't keep it for themselves quietly. They, they sent it out. They declared it in the world. And the translators uh, use this pronoun here. Uh, for we, I think, just to identify that John's probably referring to the community of the apostles. That and maybe the New Testament church thus far. But either way, th there's a unity here amongst those who have experienced the gospel. A unity that they've experienced for a purpose. In, in John's gospel, chapter 20, he says in verse 30, it says, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. He says again in 21, 24, This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things, who has written these things down, and we know that his testimony is true. So, so John even writes his gospel for the purpose to go with all of the other proclamation he gave. And so what, what part of proclamation, uh, what part does the proclamation of the gospel play in your life? How, how much of your time, your speech, uh, your world is dedicated to proclaiming? W would people describe you as someone who had the words of life? We should want that. If we've met the risen Christ, if we've met the King of glory, we should have a desire to proclaim it. The Holy Spirit that empowered the apostles lives in us, right? We should proclaim it. That's Second Peter 2, verse 9 says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, listen to this, 
that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. We belong to Christ so that we may proclaim His excellencies in the world. Proclamation. So, He testifies to the eternal Christ, the manifestation of the physical Christ. He's talked about the proclamation of that in the world, but He gives a purpose for it. Look there again in verse 3. It says, That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So, He's making this description that the word of life is proclaimed to produce fellowship. In in verse 3, we see the purpose of John's preaching and and the apostles' preaching is that you too may have fellowship with us. So this word fellowship is koinonia, right? Everybody knows koinonia. We we say it all the time. Christian circles always talk about this word uh, for fellowship, this, this picture of commonality. A communion, agreement, a mutual commitment, a believing the same truth, having the same mission, being of the same mind, having the same Lord. It's koinonia. And so it's obviously a, a unity that, that we ought to pray for. right? We, we ought to pray that we have that type of fellowship here. Um, Psalm 133 says, How good and pleasant it is when brothers... Dwell in unity. So obviously that's something we pursue and pray for. But, but notice here in the text, uh, the fellowship that John is stressing is not necessarily a fellowship with one another yet. Uh, at this point he says, it's an us. You may have fellowship with us. Us being the we, right, who have had this experience. And so he's talking about uh, the fellowship of the apostles. And when you really break that down, what is the fellowship of the apostles? How do we have fellowship with the apostles? It's with their teaching. It's the, it's the New Testament scriptures, right? Combined with all the scriptures, that, that's the testimony of the apostles. And so they're God's inspired messengers, as Peter writes, carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is what sound doctrine is. And so to have unity with the apostles is to have unity with the Bible. And vice versa in the negative, right? There's many people that have no unity with the Scriptures, but believe wholeheartedly that they have union with the Apostle. Right? And that's just not the case. There is no unity. There is no true Christian fellowship without doctrine. Shared doctrine produces that. And so John is saying here, when you embrace these things, you have fellowship with us. When you believe what we taught about Christ, you have fellowship with us, and you are part of the body. And and listen there in verse 3, he says, And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So obviously it's important for us to have fellowship with the apostles. Um, It's incredibly important for us to have fellowship with like-minded believers in a Bible-believing church, but there's a greater reality, right? Ultimately, above all of that, and all that will flow from it, is fellowship with God. Right? Fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. I mean, what do you have in common with God? We, as sinners, we don't have anything in common with God, right? As fallen sinners... We have nothing in common. But through the gospel, God sends the Son. God the Son comes into the world and history, and He puts on flesh, right? That's commonality with us. He puts on flesh, takes our sin upon Him, and brings us into fellowship. Second Peter uh, 1 says that we become partakers of the divine nature. Uh, that term in Second Peter 1 comes from koinonia. It's koinonos. It's from the same root word. 
What a beautiful description, right? This fellowship with God, partakers in the divine nature. And so, we're moving towards a close here. But we, we've considered fellowship with the apostles. Shortly, the vertical dimension of fellowship with God but we can't we can't not consider this the horizontal dimension, right? All of these things we've talked about flow out in the horizontal fellowship. First Corinthians one nine says that God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son. The fellowship of his son. It's 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 the fellowship of the Christians, and, and I think that Paul has both of these in view here in 1 Corinthians 1. Um, fellowship and union with Christ through the gospel, but also through the church and through his people. Uh, one commentator said it this way. It says, fellowship is a mutual bond that Christians have with Christ that puts us in a deep eternal relationship with one another. So, so to be called to Christ is to be called to fellowship. In other words, uh, David Mathis uh, said this in an article. Um, he said, God has given us each other in the church, not just for company and co-belligerency, and not just to chase away loneliness and laziness, but to be to each other an indispensable means of His divine favor. We are for each other an essential element of the good work God has begun in us and promises to bring to completion. Uh, I love John Piper always says, eternal security is a community project, right? Uh, be because there is no Christian faithfulness apart from the church. There just isn't. It, it's kind of funny. It's not really a joke, but... You, you can almost know every time you hear someone give you this crazy off-the-wall theology, the first thing I want to say is, what church you go to? Because usually it's, I don't go. <laughs> you know, it's, it's usually the case. Behind every uh, crazy Facebook theology debate is rarely a church member in a faithful church in good standing that preaches the truth. Rarely. Rarely. There's a direct correlation here between the obedience of the Christian and the level of their connection to the local church. It's the truth. It's the way it is. God has called us to a Christian fellowship that is a means for our perseverance. It is a method that God uses for that. And... John concludes the pro prologue here in verse 4. He says, And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. And so you could summarize these first four verses to say that the fullness of joy is in Christ and in Christian fellowship. John 15, 11 says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Romans 14, 17, says, The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Psalm 16, 11, says, You make known to me the path of life, and in your presence... There is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So according to these verses, John's joy will be complete when he shares in this mutual fellowship in Christ and in the body of Christ. And he wanted his readers to experience that joy. And so what is Christian joy? What kind of joy should the Christian 
have? How do you describe it? First Peter one eight. Peter writes, Though you do not though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him, and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. And so, so Peter says Christian joy is inexpressible. It's unspeakable, uh, some translations say. Um, the term here in the Greek, too, is, is what's referred to as the hopox, and that, that means it exists nowhere else. Uh, there's no other New Testament reference for the term here for inexpressible. And really, I think that's appropriate because we couldn't try to say it. Um, some, some early Greek writings uh, just use it sometimes to say that words aren't adequate. Right. Words are insufficient to describe this joy. And so this joy, because of Christ, is available to us right? through the gospel. If we take our eyes off Christ, we'll lose it. If we lose our focus on Christ, we'll miss this joy. Charles Spurgeon, referring to the joy of the Lord, said this, he said, if any of you have lost the joy of the Lord, I pray you do not think it to be a small loss. So that's the question. Do we have the joy of Christ? If you do, it's the Holy Spirit, right? Galatians 5. It's the Spirit producing that in us. It's, it's, a, it's a joy that's not extinguished by circumstances. It's a joy that's not impacted by the troubles of this world. It's it's indistinguishable. So may God correct us, turn our attention to the gospel as primary and Christian fellowship as a result. Let's pray together. God, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the testimony uh, of the apostles. Um, that we have in the Scriptures, the, the promises of joy in the Gospel. God, we're thankful for Christ's work, for His incarnation, His resurrection. God, we pray that You would fix our eyes on Your truth, You fix us eye, our eyes on, on Christ and on Your Word, and that we would be unified, that we would be a church that is full of the words of life and that we would proclaim it in our life. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.